Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this uh, special screening of No No Girl. Um, as you probably know, these are the, some of the people who are behind the movie. This is writer director Paul Daisuke? Daisuke. Daisuke. Daisuke Goodman. Yay! Writer, writer, director, and editor. This is producer Lori Miho Goodman. And that's a big shot, Chris Tashima. <laughs> and gosh, I hope I pronounce this correctly. Mika Joe. Mika Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm just meeting them, too. Um, before we get into the movie, usually we just start talking about the movie. But as some of you may know, there's a very interesting personal story here about Paul's journey into making the film. Um, Paul is a, a cancer survivor. You could call it a call him a two-time cancer survivor. That, that's fair? Very fair. Yeah. Um, He's had a couple of very serious bouts of leukemia. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but my impression is that during your treatment for each of these uh, bouts of leukemia, you've been writing scripts. You wrote the scripts for two shorts and two features, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, we, all of us who have trouble getting out of bed in the morning, can look at them. <laughs> Um, I think you're, you, you're quoted as saying, uh, get cancer, make a movie. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to elaborate. I don't yeah, know. please. I don't know we hope please that's do. not a pattern. <laughs> yeah, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Tell us something about um, being in treatment, chemo and, and whatever, and what motivated you to, to write scripts or films while you were in that state? I think a lot of people here saw me during that time and, and know that I went through a lot in the last six years dealing with cancer and trying to find my place in my career and my life. And this was in my 20s when I feel I felt ambitious and I wanted to do things in the film industry. And I did do a lot, and then when cancer came, I was 25, and I had to shift my entire life to figure out how to keep telling stories and being a filmmaker. And it kind of manifested in doing things I could do in the hospital bed, which was writing and editing. And I mean, I really love these things, and, and they allowed me to pursue another path in filmmaking, which was narrative filmmaking. So I started writing scripts, and then, you know, I see my crew right here. We, I would be an outpatient, and we'd go out, and we'd shoot films. And then um, during one month of outpatient, I'd ask my doctors if I could get an extra three days on the front and three days on the back, and we just push the chemo a little bit. <laughs> and we shot a feature film in that one, and that went to be evergreen. It was a good time, yes, yeah. Um, and that was the end of first cancer, and I thought, you know, that would be the end of all cancer, but I ended up relapsing in December 2020 at the height of COVID, and uh, it was really hard. It was really hard because I couldn't have my family or anyone else around me, and, you know, I ended up getting a bone marrow transplant, and Lori was my bone marrow. Um, she was my donor. Yeah. And... Uh, and we made a movie about family. Mm -hmm. And that, that was No No Girl. So when um, filmmakers complained to you about how hard it was to make their movie, <laughs> um, and you're the donor. But see, I, I wonder about that dynamic on set. Like, do you, do you say to him, you, you can't have that location? And he says, how can you say that to me? I had cancer. And you say, look, don't argue with me. I gave you bone marrow. <laughs> You make that argument once or twice, but then it kind of checks itself out, you know? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, as, as I would guess, a number of folks here are as well. Uh, you two are also descendants of um, someone who was interned by the US government for the terrible crime of being Japanese. 
Um, so I wonder uh, how many folks here can say that they have a connection like that? How many folks? So yeah, quite a few. So there are, there are a hell of a lot of stories to tell there. Why did that story influence this one? I mean, when I watch this film, it's not what you expect uh, from a film that's rooted in the story of Japanese American internment. So what are the roots of that story? Lori and I are, are Yonsei, which is fourth generation Japanese American. And I kind of feel like as Yonsei, you don't have the same, every generation has a different relationship with the camps. But the camps are a part of our identity equally. You know, I think our relationship with camps feels the most distant, maybe because it is the most distant. But the story, the people that were there, including our grandfather, a lot of them have passed away, and, and the first-hand sources aren't around. So our relationship with the camps is very historical and anecdotal and secondhand, but it's a huge part of who we are in our history. And I think. I told the story from the perspective of a Yonsei character, or at least someone two generations removed from the camps. And I just used that to channel how it is to be distant from something that's so much a part of you. Hmm. It's an interesting way to put it. Um, because watching it, the details in it, such as burying treasure in, in the yard, I would imagine I would imagine that that is something that rings true for some of the families here. Um, but then the, the rest of it felt sort of metaphorical to me, digging through the past, a painful past, to, uh, to find something truthful. Exactly. And, you know, our grandfather was at uh, Rower in Arkansas and then in the 442nd. And he went on to, you know, build space shuttles for NASA. He was a true American hero. And we live in the shadow of this legend, like all of us who have relationships in the camps live in the shadow of all that past. Having the characters dig it up is a metaphor in itself, but it's really, it's, it's, it's like something to move that feeling towards, you know, the family's all looking at this treasure as something different, just like they're all looking at the camps as it was a different relationship to them. Mm -hmm. The treasure and the camps and everything buried in the ground in their history is just a way to get them all to come together and talk about what it means for them and what it took to get to this place. Okay, so you're you're uh, writing this script. You've, you've got an idea for it. You're, um, I guess, a few months out of inpatient treatment, and you hook up with Chris Tashima. So, um, Chris, what can you tell me about the pitch to you? What made you... Uh, what sold you on the script, on, on the character, and on Paul? It was a combination of a few different things. Um, Paul's story, you know, what, what took him, brought him to the point where I'm sitting there talking with him, and he's already made a feature film and survived cancer twice and has this great script that he wrote. Um, it would be hard to say no to that. Uh, reading his script, though, you know, I was I was really touched and moved. Um, well, first of all, I thought it was really funny, very well written, but you know, it was a it was a nice, fresh view on the impact of internment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I told him I, I don't I don't think I've ever seen a film like this. Um, I'm Sansei, third generation, um, which would be his parents' age. Um, and because I'm in theater and film, and you know, I've gone through a lot of history about camp and studying it and reenacting it and filming it and putting it on stage. Um, but it, it's, it's always been that experience during the war. There is very little post-war that, that's been uh, produced and certainly not contemporary uh, Yonsei experience. Mm -hmm. And that, that really means a lot to me, you know, that they care, you know, that it's nice that there's still, um, I think, respect and, and interest in what that was like, what that, what that meant to all of our families. Mm -hmm. Because for each family, it was different. Yet we can all, you know, identify with 
well, what camp were you in and you know what the similarities and how that impacts the next generation. So that, that I think is really important to explore. We're just barely touching the tip of the iceberg, but you know, it, it's starting to be talked about now. And so um, I, there's no way I could say no to this. Um, and I'm really glad I didn't. I think you hit on something very interesting there, um, especially when we look at uh, the political climate today and you see study after study that shows so many Americans don't know who fought in World War II, right? You've, you've all seen those studies. Who were who we fighting in World War II? But I have a lot of, for instance, Jewish friends who know very well because they have, their family has a deep connection to it. So maybe, maybe that's true of Beyonce, I don't know. Um, and I, I meant when I introduced this gentleman, I don't, it gives me a kick to say Oscar winner Chris Tashima. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so I wonder, once he signed on, what did that mean to the production? And uh, what was Chris's impact on the production, both of you? I mean, I remember when Paul reached out to Chris initially. Uh, I don't think Paul was really expecting to get anything back. Uh, you know, when you cold call someone like, like Chris, you're just kind of like, Maybe. Um, <laughs> but then, you know, Paul's still recovering from treatment at this point. And so um, he was convalescing at my parents' house. And I remember him coming downstairs one day, and he just has this look on his face. And we're all like, what, what's wrong? And he's like, Chris Tashima emailed me back. <laughs> and it was unbelievable. And we're so grateful and thankful for your contribution to this production production because it would not have been the same without you and uh, it's it's been such an incredible experience I mean having Chris be a part of this I think was influential for all the cast and crew on set it, it just kind of brought everything up a level like we have to we have to bring our stuff <laughs> Mickey you're nodding there was this something you wanted to add um, yeah I was very nervous when uh, I saw a Chris's name there, because I mean, I'm just some nobody high school, or college kid, sorry. <laughs> Whoa, I'm a lot older than I think I am. Pandemic did that to me. Um, but yeah, like seeing his name there and being like, oh, okay, it's uh, no big deal. It's just an Oscar winner <laughs> casually in the cast, um, playing the most intimidating character and being the most intimidating person on set was, um, it was very scary, but, um, under this very cold and grumpy exterior, Chris is, uh, was very warm and encouraging through the whole thing. Um, yeah, one day he brought his Oscar to set, and we all like looked at it, and it, I like held my breath when I got too close. They were like, "You should hold it," and I was like, "No, no, no, I will not be doing that." Um, yeah, but uh, I think, like Laurie said, having him on set was um, kind of affirming for everyone that like. Oh, okay, we we are at this level of production, and we can be at this level. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that leads naturally, Laurie and Paul, to how you found Mika. I mean, you must have looked at a lot of people for the role. So, um, what made her the right choice? I was Team Mika from day one. <laughs> <laughs> I was Team Mika from day one. <laughs> no, <laughs> we did go through quite an extensive casting process, and I remember watching Mika's first audition and knowing, like then, like okay, do we continue or do we just go here? And it, you know, we did our due diligence and we did do our casting, but she was just so good off the bat, and we had callbacks, and it was all just formalities because. I mean, she owned us at that point. It was over. Yeah. I mean, in the script, the previous script, uh, it introduces Sue's character as having jet black hair. And that changed so fast. <laughs> her, her audition was pink. And, and now she, the poster's pink. And everything's pink. Yeah. <laughs> She put in all these changes. She put in the fight scene and everything. That's all her. <laughs> I mean, 
She's she's a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> well, how is this for you? This is your first film, right? Yeah, this is my first uh, ever film. All of my credits before this have been live theater. I'm shaking so much. <laughs> um, they've all been live theater, um, mostly stuff from college and a lot of high school. Um, yeah, so this was definitely nerve wracking. My dad sent me a Facebook post that I couldn't open because I wasn't on the you know your Japanese American when uh, page. Like I had to apply uh, and then, and so that I could view the post. Um, and I was like, well, might as well. They're looking for a 20-year-old Japanese-American female. I, I'm 20 years old and Japanese-American and female-identifying, so why not? <laughs> um, and I sent in my self-tape. I was like, all right, what did I learn in my classes? How to do this? Let's frame it correctly. Let's get one of my good friends to um, read for me, who I trusted. Um, and I was like, might as, might as well do this. Um, and for the callback, Paul sent me the entire script, which I had only had for the first audition, just two scenes to read from. Um, and on my own was like, okay, maybe there's these things that would like maybe happen in her life, kind of bring it, bring it back to my life um, to fill in those character gaps. And then I got the full script and was like, whoa, she's in her third year of college, struggling to look for roommates in this situation here. Um, she's like struggling to find friends. She has an uncle, Kenny. I have an uncle Ken, he's in the audience. There's like, there's so many like little weird overlaps with my life that I was like, whoa, did you like spy on me for the past, <laughs> for the past couple, like even, there was even just something small with the fact that she's the youngest in the family and her brother and her cousin are best friends and she feels left out from that dynamic. Like that was, I'm not knocking my brother, my cousin Tim. I love them. I love them so much. But just because I'm so much younger than them and they're boys and you know they would go play video games and things and I would watch movies and, and sew things with my aunt, there was like a disconnect there and that was also mirrored in the script. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> if they want someone who's like, this is my life, I will be there. Uh, and I was like, if they need someone who needs more experience, then I'm not that. And I kind of just like let it go and put it out in the world and was like, well, this is gonna go how it's gonna go. And thankfully they chose the life experience. <laughs> uh, we have some questions from the audience, but before we get to that, I, I just wanna ask um, about the learning curve for you and, and your perspective of uh, working with Mika as well, Chris, but uh, working on, what was one of the most important things you picked up from your first experience on a set? Um, I think just, was kind of something that I had heard in my classes, and then um, really the um, like firsthand experience nailed that in of um, not making it about me, and really focusing on what can I give the people I'm acting with, um, so that they can do their best acting, and what can I take from them mm -hmm. to do my best acting. Like there was one day where my dad asked Jill, like, how how are you so good at this? Um, and she was like, well, I do theater, so I'm used to doing things over and over again. And then she looked at me and she was like, and, and she's just so good to work off of. You just give so much. And I, I like started tearing up. I was like, oh, that's like all I'm trying to do. That's what my <laughs> teachers told me to do. Um, but that was like really affirming and I kind of took that with me the rest of the way. I was like, what are the actors here giving me that I can take and I can make this performance as good as I can? Um, and not get in my head about me being perfect and me being the star, because that's that just gives like a very self-conscious performance that nobody really wants to see. Chris, uh, apart from Mika, or including Mika, what was your uh, experience like working with uh, all of these young actors? Well, first I want to say a couple words about Mika, you know, because when I so when I met Paul and I read the script and I seen his previous film and I had faith in him and I said this is great, but I'm thinking, who's going to play Sue? This is that's the whole movie. Um, so you know, I'm 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 just really happy that we have Mika because it's not easy to carry a picture. Not everyone can do it. Um, you can you can cast a great actress, um, but that's not the same as being the star. And I mean, I'm just speaking as a filmmaker, you know, when, when you have a role like that, you have to 
put so much on that casting, because that's your whole movie. You can do everything amazingly, but if that fails, your movie's just not going to be there. I told, I told Mika earlier today the, the three questions, the three steps to answering if you are a movie star. The first one is getting picked, getting cast. Check. The second one is performing it. What you're doing on set. Check. We had all that. The third one was, what's the audience response? Because you, that's not in your hands. It's not up to you. That's going to tell you if you've succeeded. And I think, oh, yeah. I, think, I, think I think they like you. So, what a relief. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I didn't know until I saw the first cut of the film, which is a little, a little while back, but very close to this. And, and I, seriously, what a relief. What a joy this movie's going to make it, because we have, we have an amazing story and an amazing lead, and what can we do now to, to get people to see it? Um, you know, I, I also told Paul, you know, because I, I, was, I was really amazed at how small this crew was, yet how efficient it was, and how friendly it was, and how easy it was. And I'm just, I, I'm kind of thinking like, well, all the other films that I've been on had all these other people on it. And it's not like, you know, they weren't working, but <laughs> as you could see, as you could see, everyone did double, triple duty. So, you know, it, it's, Paul's worked with these crew before, um, a lot of them. Um, I want to acknowledge Ben, our DP. He would light a scene in quarter of the time with two instruments, and it's beautiful. Um, and, and that was really important for all of us to keep going because, you know, you can get bogged down on things and all kinds of things can go wrong. When you set out to make a movie, everything is set up against you, and it's you've got to pull everything in your favor and make it work for you. And I think that comes down to Paul. And, you know, the, the atmosphere on set, the people that he brought in, his direction, um, and everything, he, he did all of the post-production, um, so it's 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 been a lesson for me just to watch him work, um, and and look at what he can do with so little, and you know it, again his whole his whole story is inspiring and the movie is inspiring. So I'm I'm so happy for you, Paul. I really am. We do have a few questions from the audience we should get to, and uh, it, it's a good thing, good segue you provided talking about the audience reaction. The first one is from Justine Yamashiro. She says, uh, they say we're our own worst critic after watching the movie and seeing how the audience reacts. Is there anything you would have changed? <laughs> I'm asking this of a filmmaker, like, this is gonna be a five hour answer. No, I don't think I would have changed anything, but. I think, yeah. I mean, the thing about this movie is that it takes so long to make. You know, when I was writing it, I was a completely different person. I was didn't have any hair. You know, it was like that level different. Like, I was going through so much. I was so in a different place. And that's during writing. And then when you're filming, I'm recovering. I'm better. I'm surrounded by people. I'm engaged. And in the post-production, when you're editing, I'm you know, in a cave, like in the dark, just like solitary, but it's beautiful. And, and, you know, so when you see the final product and you look back on your work, you're like, wow, I'm a much different person since when I first read this. And I'm, I've grown and become more and learned so much more. And in that way, you don't look at that and you say, I would have changed this. You look at the next film, which we've got next films. And you say, I know what I'm going to do next. Good answer. <laughs> All right, from Akira for Nietzsche Bay for Paul. Um, oh, okay. 
This film felt like it centered around many Yonseis and all later generations' uh, sense of alienation from their family stories about, oh, this is long, about <laughs> internment and passed down generational trauma. Do you relate to this as a Yonsei? And did you take inspiration from your own experience? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned how this film is, you know, a part of me and Lori and how being Yonsei and telling the story you know, talking about Japanese American history in Janum is so intimidating. It's like an out-of-body experience. You come here to learn about Japanese American history, you know, but we we feel, I feel, as a Yonsei, like my relationship to the camps and, and to all the trauma that our grandfather and our parents and our grandmother, all of them, went through is is so separated compared to how our parents feel about it. You know, in the film, the parents say like we lived through it and this was a part of our lives. The like, camps aren't really a part of our day-to-day -day lives. It's a part of our identity, it's a part of our history and a part of who we are and what made us. But understanding where we come from and understanding that is, is, a, is a journey that I think we have to be more proactive about to learn more about, you know, me and Lori, I guess. I think the other generations, it was, it was in their life more, more prevalent. Or do you want to add? Yeah, I also feel like, you know, it was so common with um, the generation that was in the camps for them not to talk about it after after coming out. And, you know, so the Sansei generation grew up knowing that their parents were in the camps, but never really having the relationship to be able to talk about it. But I feel like with the Yonsei generation, with our generation, especially with the political climate being what it is today, we, we feel a responsibility to talk about it. And so opening up these, these channels of conversation is really, really important to us. And so we're trying to open up all these channels of dialogue with people a lot of the time that aren't here anymore. And so, yeah, I think that the, the repercussions of the generational trauma really, uh, yeah, it's really intimidating to talk about here. <laughs> Well, that's a good segue into a question from Jeff, the ubiquitous Jeff. Um, and actually, I'd like to ask it of all four of you. Do you feel that through the production of No No Girl, you deepened your connections to your family and history? I mean, yeah, absolutely. It was the the flashback um, with the with the war um, with the soldier coming home from the war. That was our Jichan's jacket. Um, and getting to break that out on set and having Kevin, the actor, uh, wear it, I, I was like, Mom, come check this out. <laughs> like, it, it, it just breathed life into something that, you know, we haven't seen in how many years. And, yeah. If you look at the stitching, too, if you watch the scene again, he hand-sewed the gopher broke patch on his own military uniform. You can see his stitching because it's not by done by machine. It's one stitch after the next in a pattern. It's not perfect, but it's you can tell he tried to make it perfect. And RG Chan died when we were pretty young, like bef around the age of 10, when we were 10. Um, so we didn't really get to have that much relationship with him, but my mom tells stories about RG Chan all the time. And she she makes sure that his legacy lives on and i think that that's that's also common of all of our friends growing up we we heard stories about our our grandparents from our parents and and i think yeah just um it, telling this story specifically you learn how much we're not alone yeah especially with this cast <laughs> Uh, another good segue. Um, we're running out of time on Q&A, but I was wondering if it would be all right to bring down the rest of the cast who's here. going to have no hope of, of introducing these folks, but um, I want to uh, I want to throw this out to anybody who is who is involved in that coda 
at Manzanar. Um, what was it like for you, anybody who's involved, and in, including any crew out there, uh, to be on that site, to try to make that the, the coda of this film? Anybody want to talk about that, being there? Uh, sure. Um, I remember when we got there and uh, like actually we were staying in Lone Pine and then we drove over. Um, when Paul and I looked at each other after filming something and we were just walking back um, to like reset for that shot and we were like, dude, we're filming at Manzanar. Like we just looked at each other and had this moment of as like storytellers and filmmakers, the two of us have dreamt about filming something there but never actually been able to do it. And it's always just been this big dream that's like, oh, maybe we never will. Um, and when we were actually doing it, it was absolutely insane. Um, just like walking through the camp, it was different. It was more alive in some way because we were bringing this to people who haven't seen, especially since it's been like remodeled and there's the barracks and things, um, all sorts of exhibits there that people haven't seen. Not a lot of people make that trip out. You know, it's on, on the way to Mammoth. It's a couple hours out. Um, it's not just like, oh, hey, let's visit there after we go see Janum. It's, it's a trip that you take. Um, and getting to share that with people and knowing that we were going to share that with people um, was very, uh, I don't know, there was just like, um, I don't know the word, but there was just something so magical about it um, that when Paul and I were there and everyone, we all just kind of felt this, this magic of yeah. <laughs> being there and knowing all the things that this is going to do um, and all the dreams that were coming true in that moment. Yeah, it was it was crazy going. It had just snowed, and so as you saw, the mountains were gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was it was humbling being there. You know, we we were walking on these paths that I, that were walked on eighty years ago in a very different circumstances. And like Mika said, you know, I grew up on the way up to Mammoth. We we'd stop by Manzanar and. Um, Hannah Lee, who was also on that trip, it was so interesting to see it through her eyes because she had never been there. But, you know, we had been there many a time. And and seeing this, this part of American history um, that is so often overlooked um, through the eyes of someone who had not known about it, it was, it really brought the gravity of the situation of what we were filming because we were, were hopefully shining a light um, for people who don't know this story. I mean, it's so great. So many Japanese Americans are here and, and we are all so familiar, but I also hope that this reaches an audience that isn't so familiar with this story and that this it's passed on. All right, uh, thank you so much for answering our questions and uh, thank you for attending the screening. Ladies and gentlemen, the cast and makers of No No Go.